Well, good morning to everyone. Good morning. My name is Tim, one of the pastors here at Emmanuel, and we, we welcome you to, to worship today with us. We're glad that you're here, and if, if you are a, a guest, a first-time visitor with us, we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, we do welcome, we have a visitor's card there in the seats. You're welcome to fill that out. I would love to learn about you, get to know you, um, but that is also an opportunity to offer a prayer request. If there's things uh, that we want to be praying for, uh, we encourage you to, to put your prayer request on there. Love, love to hear that. So, but again, we're, we're, we're glad that you're here on, on this Sunday. A couple, a couple announcements, a couple of things I want to draw your attention uh, before we uh, begin worship. Uh, in, in your bulletin, uh, you can see there the announcement section, which starts on page 16. A couple things I want to draw your, your attention to. Uh, this is uh, really the start of, of Easter week uh, for us, and we want to bring attention to that uh, because of several things uh, coming this week. On, on Friday is our Good Friday service at 7 here, uh, so, so please come, be a part of that, invite friends, neighbors uh, to that. And then on next Sunday is Easter Sunday, where a little, little different, we will still have corporate prayer, but then we have a, uh, just a brunch, an Easter brunch together at 9.15. So I want to invite you to that. Uh, again, it's a great opportunity to bring friends, family uh, to church. And then we'll have our Easter service um, also uh, next Sunday. So just know that some of those things are a part of this week. Um, a couple other important things. If you're in a Bible study, in a, a group, just make sure you check with your leader that um, some of the groups are taking a break this week and, and a few are not, and, and that's okay. But just double check to make sure uh, you can see that, that in the announcements, most of those things are, are said, said there. Um, and then... A couple things, uh, we've, added a, we've added a new addition to the church, and this is very, very important, okay? There are new diaper changing stations in the bathroom, okay? And in both bathrooms, uh, so, so everybody gets a fair share, I get to say. So just know, and, and thank you for reaching out, letting us know about those things. Uh, we wanted to, to, to take care of that. And then the other thing involving kids and families, of course, the playground right now is under a little construction, uh, doing some remodeling, some, some changes with that. So we do ask that kids stay off of the playground. The, the swings by themselves are okay, so you can, be a, you can use that. Uh, but just an important thing for your safety. So, Well, thank you again. We're glad that you are here. and We do want to worship uh, together. Whether you've been here for a long time, whether it's your first time, um, we want to walk through uh, a good, healthy order of worship so that we can focus on, on who God is. Uh, so let's pray, and then we'll stand for our call to worship. So let me pray for us. Father, we acknowledge and give, uh, Lord, honor and glory to you today. Lord, and that's, that's what we want to flow out of our hearts uh, but Father, we recognize that we are in great need of you and your work. So Lord, help us, Lord, as we worship you. Lord, you are, are worthy. You are great. You are majestic in all ways. And Lord, we want to celebrate and to honor you for that. And so Father, help us today as we do that, that we see you as you are. And, and we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand together. And read our call to worship together. I'll read the first section, and if you would respond by with what is in bold. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King. Bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Praise the Lord. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. 
together from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I'll read the question and ask that you respond by reading the answer. Wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's Wherein consists Christ's exaltation? Christ's exaltation consists in rising again from the dead on the third day, in ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Please join me in our prayer of confession together, followed by a moment of silent confession. Father in heaven, as we consider the depth of our Lord's humiliation for our sake, we confess the meagerness of our gratitude and worship in response. We confess also that instead of rejoicing to be counted worthy to suffer humiliation with him, too often we are ashamed or afraid and we hide our faith. Have mercy upon us, we pray, and grant us to return to you more of the thanks and praise you deserve, and to rejoice in our own humiliation for the sake of Christ. Amen. Father, we praise you that you are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. And we praise you that we have the assurance of this pardon for those who trust in Jesus Christ. 
written for us here in Romans 5, which tells us, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now sing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Join me now in our pastoral prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are a God who hears and who answers prayer. And we come before you today on behalf of our church family, our community, and the nations to pray. And Father, we ask for your blessing upon our brother Aidan Sheets. We thank you for the love that you have shown him to bring him out of death and into life, to bring him into this church with us. We thank you for the love that you have put in his heart for you and for your people. And we thank you for the gifts and the desire you've given him to show hospitality to your church. We praise you for your kind command to us that we not be anxious about tomorrow, but instead to trust our loving Father who will most certainly care for us and who has already assured our eternal salvation through Christ. We pray that Aidan's hope would be fixed on this certain promise, and that you may grant him ever-increasing victory in over the, overcoming the temptation to be worried about tomorrow because of his greater confidence in the power and love of his heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for the Wallach family and for their tireless service to our church through the ministry of music and an audio-video aspects and everything else so much they do to serve us and we're so grateful for them in our body we praise you for the many gifts you've given them and the opportunities for work and study you've given them inside and outside of the church we pray for nathan and we thank you and praise you for the opportunity he has to present at an international conference this summer thank you also for the continued 
financial support for the Young Sound Seekers program he's a part of. We pray you would grant him to finish the spring semester well and that you would give him strength and wisdom to prepare well for a summer busy with several projects. For Amy, Lord, we thank you that you know what it is like to have a body and that you have compassion on us in all of our pain and discomfort. We pray you would give her relief from the recent high pollen count and that through this season we ask that you would increase her hope in your future kingdom where our bodies will be glorified and free from all misery. For Bethany, Father, we praise you for the opportunities you've given her to attend a dance program in Chicago this summer and then in the fall to study at Palm Beach Atlantic. We pray you would bless her preparation for and her involvement in these things, and that meantime you would grant her to finish out high school well. And for Penny, we thank you for the opportunities you've given her to develop leadership skills through the Rainbow Girls program and to develop her music skills through orchestra. We pray you would bless her in these activities and in and through all of them and above all of them to develop and mature in her love for and obedience to you. Father, your apostle Paul urges us to honor those in authority over us because they have been instituted by you, and he urges us to pray for them. And so we do pray for the government of the city of DeLand. We pray for our mayor, Bob Apgar, the city commission, and the several boards and committees who together make important decisions about our lives here. We pray you would give them humility before you, recognizing that they have their positions only because of you, and that they require your wisdom in order to be truly successful in their work. May they seek your wisdom, and may you give it, and may you bless the work of their hands so that we might live peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way, and so that the gospel might go forth through your people to old and new neighbors alike without hindrance. And Lord, we pray also for Joel and Stephanie Swanson, and the work that they are involved with in planting churches in France. We thank you for the completion of their first year of ministry there and for the role of prayer and encouragement you've given them at their church. We thank you for their church and its passion to see other churches planted throughout France. And we thank you in particular for the newest plant that has just begun in the 16th district of Paris. We pray you would bless this new church and grant it to prosper. May you give the leaders strength and wisdom to establish this church in a large community without any other evangelical churches. Raise up more people to join them in this work and bring many new people to faith in Christ through their work. In the land that is long known about Jesus and that is full of Christian architecture and history, we're aware that so many do not actually know you today, Lord. Have mercy upon them, we pray, and bring awakening to a new generation in France that your name and your glory might cover that part of the earth as the waters cover the sea. And Father, we would ask for your particular blessing upon one more uh, dear soul among us, uh, for Juliana Staples. And we thank you for her time that she's been able to be with us and with the Weldon family. And Lord, for all the grace she's been able to receive here, especially to hear your word. And Lord, and though she will no longer be able to be with us. We praise you that you are with her and that though we might have to leave a certain place or a certain people, Lord, we can never leave your presence. And so, Father, bless her, we pray, as she goes from here. Lord, may you grant your word to take root and to flourish in her life. And she may, may she know you and love you and serve you all of her days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we now sing Wonderful, Merciful Savior.
Let's pause and again give thanks. This is a reminder of all that God gives to us. It's a time that we want to celebrate uh, giving to the Lord. So let's, let's do that. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge today, Lord, again, that as we think of all of Scripture, all of life, Lord, you are the one that has started it all. Lord, you have created all things good. You have made us your people. And Father, you intend and want good things, and you are bringing that about. And Lord, you also give the means for that to take place. And Lord, we as a congregation want to stop and acknowledge and to give thanks to you that, Lord, you give us resources, you give us finances, you give us talents, gifts, Lord, in order to give them back to you or to be used for your kingdom. And Lord, we, we do acknowledge, Lord, all the gifts that you give us. And Lord, as we give to you, Father, we pray that you would take these uh, things, Lord, that belong to you. And Lord, that your name would be honored, that you would be known. Lord, that we would grow in our faith, Lord, even here, that uh, our city, our state, our world would, would come to know you, uh, Father, through the things that we give back to you. Lord, let that happen. Let that be true. And we pray all of that in the name of Christ. Amen. for the doxology.
can be seated. Well, we are continuing to be in uh, Mark, Mark 6 uh, today. You can see the, the passage there in your bulletin, or feel free to, to grab a Bible that's uh, near you. I'd love you, for you to see uh, God's Word as we get into it. Um, this is a pretty, pretty crucial, pretty important text. Uh, so let's, let me do this. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask God's blessing on, the, on this time. Father, we do, again, ask for you, uh, Lord, to show us your truth, your work. Lord, help us understand, Lord, what you are doing and, Lord, your great care and concern for your people. Lord, we love you and we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, Mark, Mark 6, 45 through 56 says this. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For all they saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Jacinarat and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages and cities or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. The law of the Lord is perfect. Amen. Amen. Well, here we come again to uh, an incredible passage in Mark 6. And I I think it's, as we begin to think about this passage, there is a, a lot, a lot going on. You know, it often makes me think of. Sometimes the experience in life where uh, whether you or me, we have walked through times in our life where we have been through something hard or difficult or even good at that. And, and we look back on those situations and experiences and we often learn more when we look back. Uh, there's times where, obviously, it's true. We don't understand when we're, we're, when we're in the midst of something exactly what, what God is doing at times, what we want to understand why, what, what's taking place. But yet, what we begin to see, and even in this passage, all throughout Scripture, no matter what we walk through, there is a commitment of God himself where the Lord is, is wanting His children, is wanting us to, to see something far greater than what we often can, can comprehend or understand. You know, the, the Lord is committed to His children. And, and a lot of that, which sometimes is, is hard to understand, but when we walk through times, God is directing us ultimately to see who he is in the midst of that. You know, that, that really brings incredible comfort. You know, in, in a text like this today, it is, it is undeniable that we see the, the power and, and the presence of Christ with his disciples. You know, that, that is one of the, the main things he is wanting to communicate to his disciples who, who, are, who are struggling on, on a boat. And yet we, we see also that, that they themselves, a lot like us, they don't get it. 
They, they don't see what often God is showing them right in front of them. You know, this was uh, very true as, as God's kingdom as was, was coming in the person of Jesus. As, as Jesus was, was walking and living out who he was and his ministry, uh, this, uh, at times we, we see ourselves, but, but over and over, uh, there is this unbelievable commitment of, of a Savior who is, who is, again, wanting to increase their faith is wanting his own disciples to say, look, look at me. I, I am who I am. And so this, this story that takes place that as the disciples go out to the sea, uh, Jesus is up on the mountain praying. Uh, there is this, this separation. There is this great struggle. And yet we see Jesus coming to his disciples on the water. Uh, we, we begin to see that the word see or to be seen or, or saw is actually a, a pretty important word throughout this text. It kind of helps us frame in truth what's going on here. See, as the story takes place, we'll see several things. Uh, we will see the reality that they themselves are being seen by Jesus. That he has not just left them. He knows what's going on. And then in that, as he comes to them, we see this beautiful truth of Jesus just wanting them to see his personal presence in their lives, even in a, in a very difficult situation. And then last, we also we see that uh, a lot like us, this heart that is hardened, Jesus is actually wanting them, again, is moving them toward a, a soft heart where they would actually grasp Jesus simply for who he is, that, that there would be belief in God is with us. And so that leads us to this first point of being seen in the struggle. You know, looking at the story, you know, just last week there in Preached On, we talked about that Jesus had taken loaves and fish and, and multiplied them. And so the disciples were a part of this. They saw what, what Jesus did. Uh, it, it was astounding. And, and even we know at this point that the crowd themselves was gathering around Jesus continually. They were recognizing that they continually saw something in Jesus that was so different. And in their minds, as we know from some of the other Gospels, they looked at Jesus and said, look, He's our liberator. He's the one that's, that is going to free us finally. And, and so that, that is why a lot, often so much pressure uh, surrounded Jesus. And so in this, in this beauty, what Jesus does in a great care for his disciples, sends them out to go across. And then Jesus dismisses the crowd, goes up to the mountain to pray. Now, it's true, we're not told exactly what, what Jesus goes to pray for. But I think what's encouraging here, ultimately not the main point of the text, but uh, Jesus, this, this is his pattern of his ministry. He, he goes to be alone, to pray. He, he goes to be in his dependent relationship on his Father, to pray to his Father. You know, the, the times where we do see Jesus going away and Scripture points to us, there are, there are some big things happening in his life. Even with the disciples, the Garden of Gethsemane, going to the cross, out in the desert, all, all these things. But what we begin to see here in verse 47 is, is quite interesting. Uh, it, it is actually pointing us to uh, this the reality, verse 47, makes the separation. That the boat goes out to the sea, and Jesus is on land a, away from them. You know, this, this separation that's being told to us is in truth setting the stage. It, it, it's actually setting the stage for what, what Jesus wants to communicate and, and, and do. And, and, and we see that in this separation, verse 48 
moves us into this undeniable reality of, of, of a Savior who actually sees what his disciples are walking through. Now, don't forget that, yeah, this is in the middle of the night, darkness. He, he's, he's up on the mountain, and, and he sees that, that his disciples are in this painful struggle. They, 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 are, they are fighting, and, and, it, and it's even uh, in the sense that, that Jesus has, has sent them out himself. Go out in this. Now, we're, we're not told exactly from this text the, the way that Jesus sees his disciples. Yes, it, it is dark. It is in the middle of the night. And, and whether he sees them with his physical eyes or not is not, not really the point. The word where he saw them is actually means that he is in, concerned with someone else. You know, that... That brings to us an incredible hope. Jesus saw their struggle. Jesus was concerned with what was taking place with his own, with the disciples that he had called to follow him. He was not just, yes, separated in a physical sense, but yet he had not left them. You know, he had commanded them to go out uh, to, to, to do something, and, and they were listening to him. They, they obeyed him. He demanded them that they should go across. And, and, and in this, we begin to see that ultimately Jesus is setting the stage again that this struggle that comes about is here for you and me to gain something. We're, it, it, is a, it is a call for us that even when uh, the reality of often doing something good, doing something that the Lord has called us to be about, uh, that he sends us to go to follow him, to follow his commands, uh, it, the reality is, and we know this, uh, just because there is struggle doesn't mean that it's bad. Just because there is a sense of hardship, and uh, this reminds me so much in, in our class before worship, we're walking through the book of Job, and we, and we, are, we are seeing the reality of struggle, uh, but, it, but it doesn't mean that, that God has, has left his people. You know, what, what we gain here is that Jesus himself is concerned about every detail Jesus himself has this, and this is often forsaken, we're, we're moving to the inc- incredible power and control that, that Christ has even over nature. We, we see that. Uh, but it's often forgotten that, that there is this constant love and concern that Christ has for his own. Uh, he, he is not removed in the self that he doesn't know what's, what's going on. You know, I think the reality for us is we often can be tempted to believe things that are, that are not true in the midst of a struggle or a hardship. We, we can equate that God is not around. We can equate that God is, is not working, that, that God is and not even committed to doing something on the inside of us. See, that's, that's the beauty even of this passage, that, that Christ was about doing something on the inside of creating faith, of, of taking a situation where they have to look to their Lord and Savior. And again, it pushes us, as we see, as, as the heart is talked about later in this passage. And so with this, there is something greater ahead. There is... Uh, in, in the sense of the disciples, they, they are overwhelmed with, with what is going on. But in truth, they are the ones that are being seen by their Lord and their Master. He knows them. He is watching out for them. And, and that moves us into the second point of us seeing his personal pref, uh, presence 
Because this is, this is ultimately what, what allows you and me to walk by faith. This, this is what allows us, as, as we start to grasp what, what Jesus is saying, ultimately, about who he is. You know, you look at how Jesus responds. Kind of the, or the, the purpose that he's getting at as he has set the stage for him to walk out onto the water. You know, verse 48 tells us that in the middle of the night, the fourth watch of the night, which is roughly around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., so somewhere right around this time, what we begin to see, the, the purpose of this separation is that Jesus himself comes to them. Jesus goes after his disciples. Yeah, we, we know in Jesus being the Son of Man, the Son of God, that yes, from the mountaintop, he could have said, stop. Take the struggle away. But, but, but does he do that? No. He chooses to go and to be with his disciples. And I think even more profound is we look at some of the phrases here. Uh, this phrase where it says he meant to pass by them. You know, this, uh, this is an interesting phrase that has been misused, been taken a lot of times out of context, a lot of interpretations with this that, that Jesus himself was, was trying to avoid his disciples. He meant, to, he meant to pass right by them. Uh, some have taken it as, as that, or he's meant to get to the other side first without them seeing him. But yet, this word, to pass by, it, it is no small word when it comes to all of Scripture. You see, what's being connected here is actually this word pass by in the same language is it's bringing us back to the Old Testament as God passed by Moses, and another example, Elijah. What, what did God do? God came to pass by with an unbelievable intent and purpose to, to show his children exactly who he is. You know, this is beautiful intent that, that Jesus is wanting to be seen. He is, yes, it, it, it is, and I, and I don't mean, and I'm not trying to gloss over this, yes, Jesus walks on water, and we see, and this, this is all tied up in, into what he says to them after their response. Jesus walks on water. Jesus has power in his, in his divinity, he is saying that he rules over all of nature. He, he is making an unbelievable connection to prove and to show, again, who he is. But really what is comforting and truthful to you and me is, you know, we, we hear the response of the disciples. They, they see Jesus. And they simply cry out, it, it's a ghost. It, it, it's a demon in, in some other uh, translations. And see, in that day, in that culture, uh, the sea, water, had this sense of, of chaos. It, it was often associated, the storms on the water, uh, that as people saw that, they, it uh, often was tied to other gods, but it brought the reality of, of evil and chaos. And so what we begin to see here is that Jesus walking on water, and, and they respond and they tie, they, they don't understand, they don't really grasp what they are seeing. It's, it's, it's like a ghost. But the text is clear. Jesus doesn't let that linger, does he not? He immediately speaks to them. He doesn't want their hearts to go where the culture goes. He, he wants to put their hearts at ease. And he says, look, uh, he wants their hearts not to be troubled, in a sense, the words. And he says something so simple, but so profound. 
he says, it, it is I. Now, now think about that for a second. The actual literal translation, and we see this beauty in the Gospels. We see this all over Scripture. Jesus is saying, I am. Which we know Jesus used this phrase, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. Like there is so much intent in what Jesus is doing because it it draws us back to even when Moses is before the burning bush. And he asks God, who shall I say that sent me? And God says, I am who I am. And so Jesus is making this connection. He is making this in front of the disciples on the water. I am. In, in, in truth, the connection with, with Jesus saying this, he is bringing the reality that he is the divine God and, and I am here with you. You know, he is God in the flesh. His character, his nature are, are on display. And yet, when that word, when that phrase is used in all of Scripture... It's not that, that God is pulling himself back. It's tied with, with, with the name Yahweh, with God himself, which is all tied to God's personal pres, uh, presence, his personal presence with his people. This, in truth, should cause us uh, to bring us the most comfort, the most reassurance that we can have in, in all of life. You, you think about what's that, what he's communicating to the disciples who, who yes, don't get it yet. But, but he is reminding them, he is saying the very truth, the very best thing that they could hear to reassure them, to comfort them in the midst of their struggle. In, in the midst of what they are even, even listening to Jesus, doing something good. We will obey you. We will go across. And he, again, is saying, I am. I am the Lord. You know, how the question comes, how does this comfort us? How does this, in reality, increase our faith? as we think about that even now. You know, I think it's very true if we're honest with ourselves. If we begin to think in the hard situations in life, the, the struggles that we walk through, uh, e even the good times, even when we think and know that everything's okay. You know, our tendency often is to look on the inside. Our tendency is to find peace security in what we can produce and what we can manage and control. You know, this story even shows that the disciples themselves, and we see this as Jesus reveals himself over and over, they, they could not control who they wanted. They could not control Jesus themselves. They often wanted for him to fit into a certain box. Uh, the religious did that. Jesus was everything not what they expected. And, and, and so our tendency is for ourselves to look to the inside, to want to control the situations of life rather than looking to the one who has come to us. The one who sees us. The one who walks out into the waters of life, who sp speaks to us and says, look, don't be, let, let your hearts be troubled. It is I who, who gets into the boat with us, who, who he himself is the one that, that brings a calm. You know, this, this should be encouraging as, as we look at Jesus' interaction, as we look at what he reveals. It it should be, whether we're walking through a parenting struggle, 
whether we're walking through a, a job situation, a, a medical condition, all the different avenues, even when we feel like we're, we're listening to the Lord, we're walking in faith, we're doing what is good, we're proclaiming His name to our friends, our neighbors, we know the reality that we, God's people will feel and be a part of opposition. That, that will take place in, in our world, in our life. And God is, again, calling us that, that He would be our hope, that He would be our security in, in the midst of whatever is taking place. And so that should encourage us, but there's also this sense uh, where there is this call for you and me to see with a soft heart. Uh, we, we get more description of what goes on with the disciples, and, and in truth, we're honest. Uh, we, we do learn a lot about Jesus in this story, but we also learn about a lot about ourselves. We, we begin to see that, yes, Jesus had just multiplied the bread and the fish. Uh, the disciples saw this. Uh, they, they took it in. And, and here we see that after Jesus gets into the boat, there's this astonishment some of the other Gospels talk about the same story. There is, a, there is uh, some belief where there is a sense of worship falling down and, and recognizing Jesus. But yet what we're told here in Mark, that their, their hearts were hardened. Even after seeing uh, the miracle of the bread and the fish. You know, what, what, what does that mean when we talk about a hardened heart? You know, in reality, a hardened heart does refer to disobedience, to dullness, to an, an obstinate heart pressing against. And, and we see this throughout Jesus' ministry where those who are thought to, to know it all, to have it all, constantly oppose Jesus, and, and this becomes their lifestyle. They, they have a hardened heart uh, the Pharisees, those against him. Uh, this becomes uh, their way of life. Now, the difference with the disciples and the religious is that, yes, that, that Jesus is revealing himself over and over to all. But yet, with his disciples, he is showing over and over. He is allowing them to hear. He's allowing them to see. He's allowing them to grasp who he is because there is this, this commitment of moving them to a, a soft heart. Uh, it, it doesn't happen yet, as we see here in this text. Uh, their, their hearts were hardened. But we, we do see this faithful commitment of our Lord a, a, of constantly laying himself out to his disciples that they would believe and trust of the very fact of who he is. That, that he is Jesus, the Messiah, the, the Son of God, God walking in flesh. You know, there, there was this constant pressure that even the disciples faced, even here, that, that, that to look to Jesus as the liberator, to look to Jesus as the one that was going to free them from, from what they thought they needed to be freed from, a, a, a government, a, a Roman oppression. And yet, we see Jesus' graciousness, his commitment, uh, that uh, over and over, he is at the internal work within his own disciples. He is wanting them to grasp from a heart level that they can trust and know and love a Savior who is pursuing them over and over. You know, I think on, on a daily basis we would recognize because we do live in this already but not yet that, that Jesus has not come back in fullness yet. And so as, as Paul walks us through in the book of Romans, Romans 7, Romans 8, that we still live in this constant battle of being either led by the flesh or being led by the Spirit. 
We will continue to fight that on a daily basis. We, we will still experience that hardship. But I think when we look at this story, there is so much hope in the truth that, that Christ is pursuing his people. Christ sees his people in the midst of the struggle. And, and yet he goes out to them in the midst of that struggle. And very simply he says, and often the very thing that we need to hear over and over on a daily basis, that, that Jesus says, it, it is I. It is I. This, as often we talked about even this morning, this ministry of presence, the fact that God has come to dwell with us, it lays the foundation of hope in, in all of life, in every area We do have someone that we can go to. We do have someone that we can cling to in in the good, the hard, the difficult, and and all these things. And so I I encourage you this morning that your hearts, your minds would would run to that very simple phrase that Jesus says, "It, it is I. Don't look to yourself. How often, I know how often I do that myself. It is a call to look to simply who Jesus is. A God that comes to dwell, to be with his people. So maybe you may be encouraged by his truth. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that you are who you are. We're thankful that even this story shows us and points us of how much help how much we need to depend on you through everything. That only our faith can be increased by you softening our hearts. And that's what we ask for. Lord Jesus, soften our hearts. Let us run to the truth that we know is true. Lord, that you are for your people, not against us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand as we now sing, Good Shepherd of My Soul. glad that you are here today to worship. Uh, that's, we, we love that we're able to do that, uh, to cry out to the Lord. And, and I, I would encourage you, even as you think about this week, uh, think about 
the fact that we move to a Good Friday service and then Easter, the, the sense that, that Christ suffered for us, take time to dwell on that. Think through that this week. Come Friday, we encourage you. And then we get the, the blessing of what Easter is, truly, to rejoice uh, that sin and death no longer hold us. You know, yes, amen. <laughs> you know, if, if you're here today and, and these things are new to you and you want to have conversation about that, we welcome that. We, we want to talk to you, those around you. want to express the hope that we do have in a risen Savior. So we, we rejoice in that. Um, one last thing before the benediction. I appreciate Tyler for, for praying uh, for us. Y'all know Juliana has been with us, um, and she goes, she moves back to Palm Beach County um, this week. Um, so we, we do ask for your continual blessing uh, and praying for her, pray for us uh, with that. Um, and so we just want to recognize that, and thank you, Tyler, so much for, for praying for that. So, so be, be encouraged now from 2 Corinthians. Uh, think, think about these truths, what it's saying about how God relates to us. From 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.